So good to be with you guys. We're going to talk about how to bring your faith to the world without losing who you are. Listen, God, think about this, the, the power that started space and time, God, utterly transcendent, totally perfect, became a human being, entered space and time to save us without losing anything of who he was. So I have with me a great priest of God who loves his priesthood, who loves the sacred, the transcendent, and has no problem bringing all of that to hang out in coffee shops and bars. So uh, he's going to show us the way. Thanks for watching. Father Michael O'Loughlin, thanks so much for being here, oh, man. Of course, it's an I, absolute I'm, honor. I'm thrilled to have you uh, because you're an incredible priest of God. Thank you. Because your priesthood has blessed me personally in profound mm -hmm. ways. Uh, Father, Father Michael has an, anointed my daughter after she was diagnosed with MS, anointed my dad when he was in the hospital, almost dying uh, from a heart attack, and those are some of the most meaningful experiences I've had in a priesthood. And you're a great friend, great, and I'm excited to lead a pilgrimage to the Holy Land with you in June. Absolutely. Yes! Me too. By the way, reallifecatholic.com, <laughs> sign up for the pilgrimage. Uh, we're going in June. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm excited to dive into this topic with you, and I'm almost depressed already because it's going to be over in 28 minutes and 30 oh. seconds, and we have so much ground to cover. <laughs> but despite the amount of things I want to get to, feel free to interrupt the conversation at any time, as always. We're here for you, so if you have questions while we're talking, you want to bust in on our conversation, text your question to 720-650-0100. 720-650-0100. Before we get into the topic at hand, I want to hear just, you know, in brief, your conversion story. You're not the average guy. Right. What brought you to a place where you fell in love with the Lord? You know, I actually never had that big doubt. And I, the reason why I think that is because our Lord knew that if I did, I'd be gone. And I probably wow. wouldn't have come back. Wow. And so I, I've always seen, I love good conversion stories, and I don't yeah. have one. And, and I've, I, I love good vocation stories, and mine's eh, you know, so, <laughs> so I'm almost like, Lord, I want a good conversion story, but I, I've realized that I would be gone. I, wow. would, I would be I like, you know, 50 cent, get rich or die trying. That's how I would have been. I would have been like, yeah, this is yeah. what I want. I'm going to do it. And if I failed, that would yeah. be it. Well, you do have the bling. I, well, yeah. That's <laughs> Official bling from my bishop. Yeah, so I don't really have one, but, but obviously my faith increased mm -hmm. and then, you know, wavers. But yeah, I just, my parents made... Jesus Christ so relevant wow. to what I was experiencing every single day Praise that God. I just said, this is the best thing ever. And it's the most beautiful story. The Christian story is the most beautiful story I've ever heard and ever will hear. And so why yes. even begin to doubt it? Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it just that, makes sense. That conviction is what fuels you as a guy who shares your faith. Absolutely. That this is the best news mankind's ever received. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Uh, it's true and good, but it's beautiful. Yeah. Absolutely beautiful. And you know, St. Therese, I think it was, who said that... Uh, you know, you, it, it, the person who's pulled out of a ditch should be grateful. The person who's spared from ever falling into the ditch, yeah, falling right. into the ditch, should be more grateful. Exactly. And uh, that's, that's you. So, so then, raised with faith, convinced of the best news ever, have a sense of joy about it. Yeah. I'm going to guess your parents are joyful in their faith. Absolutely. That to jo this day. That joy is a, it's con it's convincing, yeah. isn't it? Because you want it. So yeah. You, yeah. Even wow. though I'm celibate, I look at their marriage and go, I want that. Wow. <laughs> I want every aspect of your faith, especially how you love each other. Yeah. That's what I want, and, yeah. and I'm called to celibacy. So then from there to vocation, to the priesthood, yeah. um, what, what, what developed that inside of you? So uh, my mom told me I could be a priest when I was six, and it stuck in my mind since then, but I pushed it out. Just like, you could do this if you want. Yeah, I, I came home with a, in kindergarten, public school, and I came home with like a, a drawing of what did I want to be when I grew up. And we had watched a video, public school, and it was all these things, and one of the things was a diamond miner. And I thought, well, I know that diamonds are just compacted coal. So I'm, wow. I know this secret, so I'm going to be the most wealthy person in the world because I'm going to learn how to compact coal and turn coal, and coal's really? everywhere. Really? Why has no one thought of this? <laughs> so as five years old, I come up with a picture of me compacting coal in the diamonds and show my mom, like, Mom, I'm going to buy you a house and a Corvette, you know, when I, when I turn 20. And uh, my mom said, that's beautiful, Michael. You can do whatever you want. But just know you can also be, I know, I'm sure you didn't hear this in school, but you could also be a priest. I was like, wow. oh. And then after that, that might be cooler than compacted yeah, diamonds, right? You and know? you'll be really rich in different ways. And and then in that, it just our Lord took me by the hand and walked me through all the pitfalls. And it was it was in deep deep prayer, where I 
would imagine, okay, I'm going to come home to my beautiful wife and my 20 children, and we're going to have our chairs, we're going to have our home. Mm-hmm. And I was so surfacely happy taking that into prayer. Wow. But I had this deep anxiety with that, which made no sense. And I was like, well, let me imagine celibacy wow. and a priesthood. Then I imagined coming home to a dark, dank rectory, no one to talk to, worst day ever. And on the surface, I just said, this is horrible. But down deep, I had this piece Whoa. of like, if I could be happy even there, then I could be happy anywhere. Like that's, that's a radical piece that wow. cannot be taken away from me. If I can be peaceful in the worst imaginable way. And, and then I was like, okay, Lord, that's what I want. I, I want to sit in that for a second. That's a great okay. rule, rule to remember for discernment. Yeah. You know, when we feel the initial peace and happiness, and this is straight from St. Ignatius' rule book, yeah. right? Uh, and it's followed by a deeper yep. unrest. That's probably not the Lord. Yes. If there's an initial even fear and it's followed by peace, that's probably the Lord. Wow, that's awesome. Because okay, the so, devil only touches the surface, our Lord goes much deeper. So, yeah. so you're a Byzantine priest, yes. and I, I, I don't want to spend the entire time on this, uh, and I, because I'm sure you've probably been interviewed yeah. ad nauseum on this and are tired of repeating it. So what made you become a heretic? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah. Jesus Christ. No, um, <laughs> um, so I was... I am kidding for the yeah. viewers who have no sense of humor. <laughs> right. You, you, should, you know what? Don't Bazinga. watch this show. Bazinga. Watch something else if you have no sense of humor. Okay, so what, what, is, what is Byzantine Catholicism? Sure. So um, Byzantine Catholicism comes from uh, the little town of Byzantium which was a a little tiny town that when Constantine moved the Roman Empire from the city of Rome, he went to Byzantium and changed the name to Constantinople for a couple different reasons. One of them just because it means the polis, it means the city, and also because it sounds like his name. So, so wow. you know, so, so Istanbul was once Constantinople. The was the initial once song Byzantium. was Constantinople was once Byzantium. Yep, okay, exactly. Cool. So that's where we get the name from, Byzantine okay. Catholic. It refers to to the rite, um, the ritual of, of John Chrysostom and Saint Basil the Great. They're the ones that wrote our Mass. They the, uh, wrote our Eucharistic celebration in the fourth century. So it's old. Oh, it's very and old. And it's changed very little. Very little. And I, I love that uh, the vernacular has always been kind of used yeah. in it. So the, the, even that, the introduction of that isn't something yeah. no. novel. No. Uh, it's, a, it's an absolutely beautiful liturgy, by Fulton the way. Fulton Sheen did a Byzantine divine liturgy as a Roman Catholic bishop, and it was the first time anybody had heard the consecration in the vernacular because this was pre Novus Ordo. So, but in the Byzantine liturgy, he said, Take, eat, this is my body in the vernacular because that's what we were doing pre-Vatican II, of course, because we were doing it in the vacuum. But this is the first time people had heard a Roman Catholic priest or bishop say wow, those words in English. That's amazing. That's and like amazing. a ballad liturgy. So there's, di- there's liturgical differences, um, but there's, there's more than that. Those liturgical differences came from a different approach to God, a different approach to Scripture, a different way of thinking, yeah. and, and engaging it even emotionally. Yeah. How would you sum up that difference? So The difference of a Byzantine soul. So to, to sum it up, I would say the Byzantine soul... Is, is okay with nuance. Mm. The Byzantine soul is okay with, with, with not knowing. And mm. it responds by saying, I treasure awe. I treasure mm. standing before something that's absolutely beautiful and going, I don't need to know everything about this because I'm afraid it'll lose, I'll lose my awe of it. And mm. so I, we love mystery. We love anything that we can stand and just enjoy its presence and, and the experience of it. Whereas the Western mind, including mm-hmm. Americans, we tend to find something beautiful and we begin to like say, why is it beautiful? Let's dissect it. Right, dissect it, dissect it, dissect it. Whereas the Eastern mind, again, there's there's ways that we dissect things too, but but in general, to overgeneralize, um, we we would we treasure awe over knowledge. Mm. And so we sit you sit there in awe and the experience of the liturgy is that way too. I, I love how that <clears throat> that points to relationship. Well, John Paul II mm-hmm. talked about breathing with the right and left lungs of the yeah. church, right? So I think a Roman should appreciate and learn all this. Yeah. The, and the, the Eastern should appreciate and learn Absolutely. the Roman. But um, there's something that's so necessary that that brings. Because in, in the Roman world, in the Western thinking, you know, when you tell a teenager in a confirmation class, it's mystery. Yeah. What they hear is, ah, so you, don't, you have no idea what you're talking <laughs> yes. about. Yes. And where an Eastern mind will say, oh, cool. Yeah, exactly. And you'll <laughs> sit right, back there, and go, let me experience that. Thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let, let's let's it's that's uh, it's relational. It's not a topic I'm figuring out. It's a, it's a mystery like my marriage that I'm entering into. I haven't yeah. figured my wife out yet. <laughs> She's figured me out, but I haven't. I have no idea what's going on here. And you love that in a way. And you I you do. love never knowing your wife 100. percent I do. Yeah. And I, um, this is also I mean, this is, there's a tie in here between this and the, the you go even further east into other religions, mm-hmm. and saying it's a mystery is is 
that's that's just how it is. Like yeah. they're not trying to explain anything, uh, but there's a there's a profound beauty in that. And I think that's why, in a sense, we the the there's a beauty to the the east and the west. There's a beauty to those two lungs, mm -hmm. because there's a certain um, uh, mm. tension there, a certain challenge, but also a certain corrective. Mm. And so when you when you have those things that let's challenge each other through the tension. I want to I want to start a ministry called. Um, uh, restless union. Mm. I really think that's what our church is. It's it's a un we want union between the East and the West, between Orthodox and Catholics. That's but awesome. there's a certain restlessness there that is good. Oh it's yeah, it's always me challenging. Oh, I love that. Uh, someone just asked, can Father Michael say a Roman Catholic Mass? I could when I was in Denver. Okay. And then when I when my bishop moved me two years ago to Los Angeles, um, you lose your faculties because they need to be given by the local Roman Catholic bishop. Okay. So I know how he yes. Um, okay. But I need permission, which is now, I've now submitted my application, so I should be able to do it again. It's yeah. kind of like, can you and may I? Can I, may Otherwise I? you're going to confuse everybody. <laughs> I can't, yeah, no, exactly. So it's in process. So <laughs> All right, cool. In, uh, or in we'll have a great I immersion will. experience with Byzantine liturgies all week, which I'm actually kind of fine with. That's you had to learn cool. how to canter then, because we need to canter. Uh, so. I, I got you covered. Right. It'll be an absolute mess. <laughs> Beautiful <laughs> They're singing through the entire liturgy, and the mm -hmm. poor or ordained priests who can't sing. Right. And their congregations hate them. chant. Uh, <laughs> they got to make up for it by being super holy. Now, uh, yeah. you have a, uh, a, a profound sense of the sacred, and this is something I love about you. Um, you know, when you came and anointed my dad in the hospital, and you anointed my daughter, uh, you were crying halfway through the anointing each time. And uh, that, that you're, you're so drawn into the rites, you're in love with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, th I think of, you know, Jesus talking to Peter, do you love me more than these? Mm. I, th and thank you for making your first job to be a contemplative who's in love with Jesus. Mm. Because I want my priest to love me more, l love Jesus more than I do. Mm. Not that I, I want to love as much as I can, but your first job isn't to do stuff. Yeah. It's to be more in love than anybody else. Ideally, in the ideal world. Yeah. That the bishops would love the Lord even more than his yeah. priests. That the Pope would love the Lord more than anybody. Yeah. Um, this, and that's where the sense of sacred comes from, it's that yeah. love. I like how you say that because that's exactly how I was feeling was that this is, you, you, you're doing something as a priest administering the sacraments that, that is impossible and so far beyond your mm. ability that it has to be God doing it. There's mm. no other explanation. Isn't that awesome? And once, you, once you're in the middle of it and you realize like I'm saying all these words and doing nothing. Mm. I'm literally just skin mm. and bones standing here like reading these words and doing these things and God is alive in those skin and bones to be in persona Christi and, and then what he's doing, I, I, I cry every exorcism mm. I do at a baptism for the same reason. Wow. I'm like, the devil's afraid of me? No, he's not. Mm. The so devil's you have, you have exorcism uh, prayers during your baptism. Yeah, I mean, oh. like, like you're saying, it is you, Satan, who are condemned, come out of this child. I mean, like, like their Byzantine exorcism prayers for a baby <laughs> oh, <that's, laughs> who's obviously not possessed is that's incredible. Intense. Yeah. And, and okay, and here, uh, this is, this is an amazing balance you preserve in your soul that I think all of us have to, mm. when God gives us any amount of authority, because uh, that can lead to pride, obviously. Yes. It can lead to arrogance, it can lead to clericalism, to say what I have is this sacred, but to be simultaneously conscious that what I have is, is dwelling in, in skin and bones. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's the humbling, yeah. mind-blowing experience. Uh, was the original Byzantine Mass said in Latin, someone just asked? No, no. it would have been, it would have been well, the Byzantine coming from Constantinople, that would have been very, very Greek. Okay. So, so the the I'll say like Jesus' time speak spoke Greek and Aramaic. Um, the Greek was because of the um, the Jews, of course, were were pushed out to all these other regions, as there were so many Greek speakers that mo there was kind of the Greek was kind of the language of the empire at the time, Praise um, God. especially yeah. in the Eastern Roman Empire. And so, yeah, they would have spoke um, Greek uh, wherever they went. Yep. You know, but so there's, a, there's different expressions. It's not just Latin as the sacred language. It's good Correct. to remember that. Um, I want to show a picture on the screen. It shows a little mm. bit of the sacredness of of the the Byzantine rite, mm. and uh, this was one of my favorite pictures. I ripped this from your Twitter page. Uh -oh. Tell us what that is. So this is um, this was one of the greatest moments of my life. Um, I got to mm. be spiritual father to now Mother Natalia, mm. who was a parishioner of mine here in Denver, um, and then went on to discern becoming a nun. Mm. And uh, in the Byzantine church, just like any monk, deacon, or priest is called father. So any woman who becomes a fully professed nun, it, you call her mother, because mm. she's a mother to the world. And so at this, this part of the ceremony, she's actually dressed um, for her baptism, but also as a martyr. And so she crosses her arms wow. as for death, sorry, and then, and then she's wearing the white of her baptismal garb because of the purity of martyrdom. And so she walks up, um, and I get to accompany her, and she, she walks up and she does prostrations in the aisle, 
and then uh, and then the bishop's going to take scissors. <laughs> I'm and... sorry, it's too beautiful. Yeah, I'm like, you better look at that stinking picture, dude. I know. It's kind of my and, and the bishop then takes and hacks all of her hair off. Just no, isn't it? Didn't you say like three times? She, he, he throws uh, the scissors down yeah. the aisle three times. So so she hands him the scissors, like do it. He takes them, throws them away, and it's it's. There's various reasons for that, of mm-hmm. course. But one of the reasons is, is, do you understand the immensity of what you're doing? Like mm-hmm. you're about to leave the world to die to self for your ministry, and um and and it's it's absolutely. And I mean, like so I said, the greatest day of my life, even better than my ordination, because you like, stop looking, so I can regain <laughs> composure. I'll uh, show the yeah. next picture of her as, as mother. Um, mm-hmm. This is after. This is five so he, minutes later. He chops the hair he off, chops puts the, the outfit on. She's out of the world. Yep. Uh, so this is the sacredness of the faith. Whether mm. you're, you're uh, get the picture off the screen because I can't, I can't stop. <laughs> I gotta regain composure here. Uh, you're, and you're gonna make me cry. <laughs> What's so, yeah. right, right. It's like uh, reminds me after I watched uh, you see the Mr. Rogers movie. <laughs> no, not yet. I'll prepare myself. Dude, I was completely unstable for like three days. <laughs> <laughs> I was a mess. Sorry. Oh, yeah, this, this might take more than fifteen minutes to <laughs> regain. You have, are you Irish? I am. Yes, he has a problem. I get, I get it. I get it. Um, this is the same sense you bring into the pub. See, here's mm. the thing. A lot of people think, like, to be relevant and in the world, mm. uh, we have to do away with how sacred and sublime and transcendent all this is. So then we go engage the world. My, I've seen, I don't want to scandalize people. Mm. Well, I won't scandalize anybody who's followed the news for the past 20 years. Mm. But, you know, like, I've, I've met priests who, like, they want to hang out and evangelize, and they're, they're constantly dropping F-bombs. Or, you know what I mean? Like, uh, and people in ministry are like, we're going to be real, and it's okay to be a mess. Yeah. It's like, yeah, but it's okay to really want to be a yeah. saint. Like, be real in who you are. Yeah. And really be trying to preserve the sacred at the same time. Yeah. But that gets really messy when you bring that into the world in, in a way that's actually doing evangelization. By that, I mean not just saying, hey, come to church. Mm. Then, I'll, then I'll talk to you about Jesus. Right. Tell us what you're doing. Where are you bringing the gospel? So... Um... What I found was that when I was doing Theology on Taps here in, in Denver... Um, in the, the bars. In the bars. Yeah. I, it was much easier to invite my secular friends to that mm-hmm. because the bar was kind of their scene. They mm-hmm. felt comfortable there. They felt at home there. Mm-hmm. And so I was the one a little bit off balance. I was either back on my heels or on my toes because I, I was the one that, that, that had to say, I'm not comfortable right now. Yeah. I mean, people are going to be in their world. They may ask me questions. Mm-hmm. Um, but one thing I have found, and I thought of this when you were asking me that question just you've, now. You've, you literally... Boy, would that create feelings in you of like being on guard, being defensive? Being vulnerable, just ah, being vulnerable. There, there's, okay. there's a great risk to it because yeah. I, I can't, not that I've ever had to do this, but like I can't kick someone out of my church building. But if they're there protesting or yelling yeah, things, like yeah. I, we, we kick them out, right? I mean, you try yeah. if it's against the law. But can't kick someone out of the bar. No, and, and I, that's not my world. And so I go in there, but one thing mm. I have found that I thought was when you were asking me the question is that, that it's amazing how people think they are unworthy of prayer, unworthy of mm. attention from God, mm. and yet there's still something in them that mm. sees the priest as a representative of God. So when I go into a bar and I sit down mm. and talk to someone, they may start out by railing on me and celibacy, and I'm a bigot, and I'm this, and I'm a pedophile. And all. They might go on to all that thing. But Do you the, get that? Uh, yeah. And and But by going to a bar, like you go into a bar with your collar on mm-hmm. just to put yourself in, in, in the line of fire. Yeah. It's, it's, it's easy. You don't, in the church as a priest, you don't know if people are really your friends mm. because you're a priest or because it's Michael O'Loughlin. So, yeah. so in the bar, they don't care that I'm a priest. In the world, like, like that might intrigue them at first. And I'm about to just contradict myself here, but yeah. like in one sense, they don't care. Like I have to earn their respect as a man. Yeah. And, and as a man who's doing what he loves and as a man who's, who's dedicated to something he feels very strongly mm-hmm. about. But also, you get people who they, they do see from something, even movies, they see that the priest represents God. So they're actually honored that a priest would sit there and listen to them. Wow. Uh, and man, I'll tell you, as, as hardened as people want to make themselves, we, we, this is something that's always to our advantage. And it's, right? it's amazing. Like, the church can be a complete mess at different times in history. And yeah. the news could be all bad. Yeah. But even with that against us, <laughs> yeah. the guy at the bar can't escape the fact that he's made for God. Yeah. And you yeah. are God at that bar in the, in the mind of that person. He yep. associates you with God. Uh, before I get back to this profound question, a yeah. uh, viewer texted in, does the Byzantine Rite acknowledge the Pope's authority? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. That was a quick, yeah. quick simple okay. answer. Um, <laughs> wow. Okay, so you, you sit there at a bar. People will start railing on you. How do you transition from someone 
giving you all the garbage, which yeah. they're probably half drunk if they're really just going mm. there right away, right? I, I, you'd be surprised. I, I, I did not expect just how blunt people are to, to criticize something right off the bat. Mm. I mean, they, they said there was this one woman- Not just, just on Twitter. Right, in, re, in face to face. Wow. I had this one woman who said, who said to me, and this is a little bit about, about me. So she's sitting there, she says, so you're celibate. And she goes like, what got you to that point? And, she, wow. and, you know, and, then, I, and then I said, and I also have a, a friend who's a nun. I'm talking about Mother Natalia. And as soon as I said, how old was she when she became a nun? And I said, you know, she was 30. And she goes, who hurt her? Wow. Like, it just, it came out like that. Like, they, they, there is no way wow. you can choose this life wow. authentically. You're, you're either really hurt, really damaged, broken. Something is wrong with you if you're going to choose this life. And yet, when I'm sitting there in the bar right in front of them, they have to tell mm. me there's something wrong with you to my mm. face. And, and, and that, that dialogue allows for a Q&A, and I have to be careful not to get worked up. And then I say, I mean, I, I, then I just say to them, you know, you know. So when they're giving you hard questions... You have to be careful not to get worked yeah. up. Uh, I've experienced it before where I'll literally feel my, um, yeah. you feel the pulse go up. Yep. And then I realize I have to control my pulse. It's like, you, well, you did MMA, dude. Yeah. So did I. <laughs> right? So like when you're, if you're rolling with somebody yeah. on a mat, yeah. it's like if, I, if my pulse doesn't go down, I'm yeah. going gonna to pass out. Yeah, you have to compartmentalize the anger yeah. from how it's affecting your body and almost like jettison it or compartmentalize it so that I can yeah. act in a way that's mature and measured rather than the passions that I want to act out of. Do, do you often experience success and those conversations transitioning to a peaceful interaction with another human being? It's almost always. Probably out of 100 conversations, I've only had two that ended ended with someone like I had one where these girls got kicked out of the bar because they were just yelling at me and the, wow. and the manager came over and kicked them out. By the way, is this Dr. Dre's bar? <laughs> My, is that, is my that new one, right yeah. Now? <laughs> right. That's that's the big news. The one I go to now is I had three servers from the place I used to go to um, switch to to this restaurant called Taisho in L.A. Okay. And um, and I just I found out that my first night there I got put in the room with Dr. Dre because he's one of the major investors. I didn't know this at the time, so I kind of caught me off guard. But this is so yeah. <laughs> okay. Wait. Is, so why they put you in the room with Dr. Dre? Or is it like? We love this guy now. Yeah, well, Dr. Kind Dre's of. here. Let's go have him hang out. Kind of. So one of my friends, uh, she, she said, I'm serving tonight. You should come get my section. I said, okay. So I, I arrive with a friend, and I walk in the door. I've never been there before. And the server, the hostess says, um, I said, you know, uh, two for Father Michael O'Loughlin. And they go, oh. And I was like, <laughs> that really? <laughs> and then I walk in, and, and on the way to the table, she says, so um, Dr. Dre's here tonight. And, and when he comes, he gets one server just for him the whole night. And so, and so, but your server got picked and she asked him, can we have one other person in here because he's my friend and he, he expects me to be their server. And so Dr. Dre said, yeah. So I got to sit in there with his, his table, his security, then me and my friend were sitting next to the security. Did you talk to him? I didn't. We, uh, we, we, we nodded at each other. But okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. So, so like you have a presence in this, in this place mm. that, that people see you interacting with people and then the staff is starting to respect you. The, the owners? Christian and Paul, I, I have not paid a cent in months. <laughs> like I come in and even if they're not there, I get my drink and my food paid for. And just, wow. I don't, I don't wow. even know why. I don't wow. Know why. What a great witness to us. Yeah. Uh, and it's, I was really, it's really encouraging to hear that out of 100 conversations, two have gone south. Because mm -hmm. I think most of us fear that conversation because we, we're, we're projecting on people. We're yeah. forgetting that they're made for God. Right. Right? Hmm. It's literally lack of faith that leads to hmm. lack of evangelization. Yeah, and fear, which is lack of faith. That, that's it. Yeah. I'm forgetting they're made for God, and I'll presume that if I go there with this crazy world, that people will go off on yeah. me, and then it'll just end horribly. Yeah. And you just keep leaning in through that fear and keep finding, no, it ends really well. Well, our Lord has also protected me from a lot of bad experiences. I think yeah. I would fear if I had PTSD. But, but even even these bad experiences, like I said, mm. the manager took my side and kicked them mm. out. And so things like that, I, the, our Lord is, is protecting me from, I think because he sees the, the fruits, which thank God, yeah. but he's protecting me from, because I, I, I know, and this is just being falsely humble, like I know I'm prone to PTSD. I know that I'm prone to fear. Mm. And I know that I may even try to walk through that door and do it again, but I would just sit there a nervous wreck if our Lord didn't explicitly protect me and empower me like in those moments wow. to, to, to do his will and to like look at that person and say like you're the I'm a I, I my whole life dedicated to God and right now it's dedicated to you 
oh, you know, for God. this moment. And you're everything to me. And it doesn't matter if your boyfriend, your girlfriend's yelling at me or mocking me or saying how, you know, what's wrong with you? You know, I, some guy the other day is like, his, his girlfriend's talking to me and he's like, you know, you're celibate, you don't have sex, no. Well, don't you have prostate issues? And he's like saying all these things to me, like as she's trying to have like a normal conversation with me. And I just completely blocked him out. And wow. his girlfriend just kept on talking to me. And, and I was like, I, I, I <laughs> <laughs> Back to the MMA days, dude. Yeah. We're rolling. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Marilyn Barone from Pittsburgh says, Hi. Hey, Fond Marilyn. memories of you while you were in the seminary. Example, passing out socks to the homeless downtown. Yes. <laughs> That's great, yes, man. that was fun. Um, what has, uh, you, you said you've gotten better at this. So you said this mm. before we, we were rolling. Like, you, you, were, you, you did this a bit in Denver. Yeah. You'd sit down in the Starbucks. You'd sit down where people who were not engaged in the faith would go. Yeah. You get your work done there, genuinely. Like, yeah. You're, yeah. you're typing up your homily notes and stuff, but you're there available to people first. Um, you, you've gotten better at this. You've gotten more aggressive with this yeah. in a gentle I, way. What's changed in you that made you get better at this? I think I got moved. My bishop moved me from Denver, where I had been a priest for 14 years, and I, my, in kind of mm. subconsciously, I assumed, I assumed I'd be here forever. And so I'd make relationships with people, assuming that I'm going to walk with them until one of us are dead. That's how it is. Wow. The, the Denver is my flock. And so yeah. I played the long game with everybody. And then I got moved, and all these relationships were cut off. Father Nathan Goble, one of my, one of my best friends, said mm. to me, um, he said, it's like you just had to give up your 14-year-old for adoption. Mm. And that's and the whole, it was the whole city because mm. like this was home. These are my children. And since I got moved, I said, "There's an urgency here. Mm. I need to be more direct." So when I got to LA, now I I know I could get moved at any moment, you know. And so I say, "We'll have a couple conversations where I'm I'm in this for the long run." Like, like we're and now I, I really want to be really really careful here. One of my, I'm very very passionate about the fact that I'm not making friends in order to evangelize. Like mm. those things have to be separate. If you never come to Christ or if you say, Father Michael, stop talking about Jesus, like mm. I'll say, okay, we're still gonna be friends, right? Like I, mm. I truly love friendships and those that needs to be separated so I'm not mm. abusing the friendships or manipulating them. Yeah. But but right now I will say I want you to be happy and therefore I want you to know Jesus and truth and beauty and goodness. So I invite people to my parish mm. much earlier. I invite people to, to talk about the transcendentals much earlier, to talk about what love is and these things much earlier than I did there because, and because I, I see and I see our Lord making fruit in that. Wow. I, and I, I love that. I want everybody watching to note this, all right? Friendship is the ordinary form for evangelization to happen. Yes. And friendship is not just to an end. Absolutely. And yes. that's one reason evangelization so rarely happens, because that's actually really, really labor-intensive. Yeah. And it requires us to actually love people, and that's yeah. not easy, man. Um, hmm. So you've, you've experienced people coming into your church from, from these conversations. Mm -hmm. tell, us, tell us a story. Um, so uh, I, I, I'll, I, I know one story. This happened in L.A., um, I, 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 I met this, this wonderful woman, and she was at a server at the restaurant and the bar I was going to. Um, and, and the first thing, she, and she'll tell you, um, she really pushed hard on me, the very first interaction. Like, mm. pushed very hard. I think it was because she saw that many of the other servers and the managers really liked me, and she didn't want to be part of that group. So mm. she's like, oh, Father Michael comes in here, and they, they, you know, they talked to him the whole night and things like this. I don't want to be part of that group. So she really pushed back on me. Um, but it was when she pushed back, it was, it was one of those very spirit-led moments mm. where what she shared with me, I, I, I perceive that she was trying to scandalize me. She was trying to get wow. me worked up. Wow. And, and, and the spirit put in my heart said, don't, don't do that. And like, she's like saying, I, I, I think, I think, and I, I apologize, you know who you are. Um, I, and I, I think that she probably at that moment hated herself. And she said, I know how I can confirm this. I need to get somebody else to hate me too. Mm. And then I was there and she said, Who's, a priest is going to hate me because mm. I did something horrible. And so she walked and she saw a priest and she, she wanted to manipulate me into hating her too to confirm her own self-hatred. Wow, and, and then profound. And the spirit put that on my heart just to say, like, I'm sorry, like, that, that must have hurt. How do you feel? Like, just absolutely loved on her. In, wow. Instead of judging her at all, like I, the exact opposite was the trace. Again, in the like playing the long game, like this is this this woman is hurting right now, so don't judge her because that's what she expects a priest to do. Wow. And then now she she comes, she yeah. hangs out with the community. She's not Catholic, but she comes in, <laughs> she comes wow. on Sunday, she comes on Wednesday, she hangs wow. out. We, we we text all the time. She's praying for me. I'm praying so for she's her. Pray, she's she's praying with y'all yeah. already. Like yeah. that's that's. She's yeah. in the door, man. And she Lord, loves keep, the people at our parish. In, Lord. Keep reeling yeah. in. That, that's incredible. Yeah. So what would you say to a lay person who, I mean, you have the advantage of, of going in with a collar on. I'd encourage you, yeah. the priests who are watching, follow that example. Thank you. Um, <laughs> right? But yeah. 
how, how, how do we put ourselves out there to, yeah. go, to go fishing in, in, this, in this way? That is an excellent question. Yeah. And that has been on my mind to say, how does that work? Because it, it, being a priest is such an advantage going into the world. Wear a cool to be Catholic t-shirt. Right, right. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, or something. I, I actually think there's like, I'm so like, I, I know a couple now consecrated virgins, right? Young women who, who have consecrated themselves and they mm -hmm. continue to live in the world. And I call them sleeper cells. It's like, you're sneaking in wow. and people fall in love with you and then they fall in love with Jesus because they fall in love with you. And I think that has to be with lay people. You go in there, like I, I call it a ministry of, of being a regular. I go into a place, I become a regular, they see my face, they, they start talking to me, and, and eventually they're, they're gonna just like me. That, wow. You know, you have to have confidence and, you know, yeah. be, be accepting of criticism. And that's not always gonna happen, yeah. of course, too. But eventually they're gonna like you. Like my mother said, I came home from third grade. And I was like, Mom, I met the girl I'm going to marry in third grade. And she's like, just know, Michael. Work? She's like, just know that, that you'll fall in love with anybody if you're around them long enough because everybody's worthy of love. Mm, how beautiful. Yeah. And, and yeah. So anyway, the, so I, I think it, a lay person goes in, just mm. has a normal relationship with them, becomes friends. And then just like a, a man, if you're going to be a Roman Catholic priest, be celibate first and then discern priesthood. You have to discern celibacy first and completely separate, I believe, or, or you're not going to be a very good mm -hmm. celibate priest. So the same thing, like become friends and then discern is evangelization going to work or not. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I, I love, um, I mean, we have, the, you have the, again, the advantage of the collar. Yeah. For those of us who don't, uh, there's the long game, the friendship, but there's also little, little phrases you could drop. Yeah. You know, like, God bless you, yeah. or like if you're going regularly mm -hmm. to a restaurant, or when someone says something, you know, something good's going on, like, oh, I'll praise God. And just yeah. let this be who you are without being afraid of that. Right. Act as if you have the best news in history because guess what you do, yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, but then you, you really encouraged me today mm. uh, to be a little quicker to get to, that, that, to, to the finish line. Amen. You know, without being afraid of it. Like, hey, would you, would you come to a small group with me that yeah. I'm in? Or would you come to church with me and check this out? Yeah. Or can I pray for you? You know, just, just go there. And, Don't and, be afraid to go there because human hearts are already there. And start something outside of the Mass or the liturgy yeah. and invite them to that and, and where yeah. they can see like-minded people and have a drink or a smoke mm. or whatever. Like, like they can do that. In, in, in like I love there's like hashtag be normal. Like, be normal. <laughs> be Catholic, pe be normal. Right, be Catholic, be normal, and people will be attracted to that. Yeah, and, and don't be afraid to be you. Right. Uh, would, you, would, you give us a, would you give us a blessing? Absolutely. I want to hear a, a, a chanted Byzantine blessing oh. before, we, before we go. And right. uh, guys, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for talking, man. Of course, Chris. Did, uh, did Matt Frag cry you, when man. he interviewed you? I cried, I think. You did. I don't he, remember, he did. but I don't, I don't remember. Frag is heartless. <laughs> Matt Frag, you're a heartless man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he can take it. I really love you, man. Of course, it's, you it's, uh, it's been a blessing. Amen. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, give us your blessing. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. May the Lord bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, have mercy on you. May our Lord protect you and send his mother to protect you. May he guide you in this pilgrimage of life. May he make you fearless. May he make you humble. May he make you holy. He'll, may he allow you to grow in wisdom and prudence. May he give you confidence and a love for the salvation of souls. May you be open to whatever vocation he guides you, free of fear and full of joy. Bless, may our Lord bless you and your families and all that you do. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Love you guys. See you next week.